what I'm going to try to do is summarize some bits and pieces, and I, I don't mean to treat it as trivial, but I've, for, the, for today, I've borrowed things from across about 30 years that I think might be useful in structuring thinking about um, treatment planning for parents of children. I'm on the neglect panel, but who have been abused or neglected. <laughs> Um, and I thought this was where I wanted to begin. A society that values its children must cherish its parents. I think we're often angry with the parents. It didn't do me any good to be angry with them. And if you have read my introduction to raising parents, you, you saw me describe my process of becoming less angry and in fact quite tender toward the difficulties that parents who do not raise their children adequately experience. I would note that children rarely live better than their parents. Foster care is the attempt to give them a better life. It doesn't usually work out that way. We add to the array of problems that they have. So, the implication is help the parents to live better lives and their children will benefit. Right now, I'm thinking very locally in the UK, right now, today, this year, parents are the only resource that isn't being cut back. Everything else is down the drain in this country. You know, I travel a lot and the recession didn't hit social services the kind of work we do in 2008, not even 2009. 2010, I didn't quite feel it. 2011, it was apparent, and of course this year is a disaster. And my traveling would say the UK is the worst off. You have had the greatest cutback in funds that are available to troubled families of any country I've been in. I'm not doing research on this, I'm just telling you I feel it here. Parents are the only resource who are absolutely committed to each specific child. And that's always been the case. I've often used the example, put together in your own mind a multidisciplinary committee of the very best professionals you know of. Stack this committee with your favorites, would you give them your child to manage? I wouldn't, because they come and they go, they go at five o'clock every day, and they go in and out of these jobs. The only people committed for the long haul are parents, even very troubled parents. I would tell you that in hard times, we can't afford to lose this resource. So my talk is organized around how to make the best of a troubled resource, and I don't minimize the problems that parents bring us. Um, what I've learned, um, they were themselves endangered children. And endangered children are not seen by their parents as themselves. Instead, they have to warp their development to meet their parents' needs. They have to go around a gap in their parents' development. They have to fill a hole, but they don't get to grow straight and strong because of what they had to do to accommodate their parents. And by the time they're grown up, they're this crooked tree that has had to warp itself, and now it too will have children. I think that to help endangering parents, those who endanger their children, we need to imagine them as they intend to be and value them even as they are. So my golden rule of protecting children is do unto parents as you would have them do unto their children. And if you think about the processes that we use in child protection, 
I think we do not usually act with parents the way we want them to act with their children. We use much stronger, more punitive, more directive approaches than we would want them to use with their children. We listen less to them than we want them to listen to their children. And I would argue we are the example. Uh, we don't say learn from us, but people always learn from what they experience. Do unto parents as you would have them do unto their children. How parents learn and change, which is the way people learn and change. They're not so unique. I think that most programs for troubled or at-risk parents focus on the content, what the parent needs to learn. Where, as a former teacher, that wasn't said, but my original work was as a teacher, and I have a degree, master's degree, in special education, so this affects how I think about things. I would now say that parents' learning depends upon how they process information. It's not what information they need, as a teacher, I need to find a way to teach so that the child can learn. It's much less important what I have to teach him as how I go about doing that. So to facilitate change, I think the interventions must fit in the parent's readiness to learn and change. I can remember going to many, many multidisciplinary meetings, and we start in with the lists from each person who's done an evaluation, and the parent needs this and this and this and this and this. If you did that with a child in school and said he needs to know all of these things, and you went in and tried to teach all of that right now, you would teach nothing, and every teacher knows that. So. We need to find out what is it that a parent is ready to learn next, not is it what we want them to learn. What are they ready to learn and start building on that? And I think the common modules that we often use um, sometimes require competencies mm -hmm. and psychological processes that troubled parents lack. We imagine them to be ready for something that they are not ready for. I think that an effective program would work in a parent's zone of proximal development. Nice educational term from Vygotsky, that's irrelevant. But a zone of proximal development is that area that you're just ready to learn. Not way out there, if we were talking math and you know how to add, it's subtraction. It's not division and it's not more addition. It's just right there, the learning cusp. And each of us has it for some information. That's where we need to focus our programs. And of course, that place is different for each person. So there needs to be some individualization Yes, you're going to group people. You can't do everything one at a time, nor should you, for the parents' benefit. But you need to know what they're ready to learn next. So I'm going to talk about finding parents' zone of proximal development. And I'm going to give you, this slide's going to come back with each of its bullet points separately. Consider the degree of consciousness that the parent has when their behavior is maladaptive. Not when they're talking with you, when they're one-to-one -one with an adult and the children are somewhere else, but in the late afternoon when they don't respond or they respond inappropriately and children are crying and everybody's tired, somebody wants a drink and somebody's late, and those conditions. How conscious are they of what they are doing? Are they able to stop and think about it? Or are they reacting in some other way? 
I'm really interested more than anything else in what people are doing when it goes wrong. Not what their best potential is, because that's not why they're seeing us. They're seeing us because of what they do when it goes wrong. So I want to know, how conscious are they? And I think the majority of the people that you work with, or that you supervise people who work with, are not fully conscious of what they're doing in the moments when things go wrong. Then I would consider the individual's bias toward what information they really trust. And I'm going to introduce three types of information that I will call somatic, cognitive, and affective. And I'll show a, show a really complex slide. Sorry, I took this from an APA, American Psychological Association, presentation. Just, I just took it, that's all. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was mine. I have the right to take it. But that's why it says APA up in the corner. Um, these, this is the representational model that I work from. It's a model. It's not reality in the brain. It's a modeling of what's in the brain. But it offers three basic kinds of knowledge. Information that is produced by the body. Information that you learn from temporal order. When this happens, then that usually follows. When my mother cranks and cranks, then my father yells and hits her. When I complain too much, when I break something, then my father hits me. It's when then, if then, information about what is likely to happen next, if this has happened. And we organize our behavior all the time around known when-then contingencies. It's learning theory, basic learning theory, if, if that's a frame that you use. And then there's intensity. And it's intensity of stimulation outside the body. The, the visual stimulation, the darkness around you, the brilliance around you, the loud noises, the silence, very light touches, the sock in the chin, um, tastes that are pleasing, tastes that are disgusting, smells that relax us, smells that set us on edge. It's the contextual stimulation coming in from the outside. And we have a biological basis for reacting to dramatic changes in that stimulation as though there were danger. There is an implicit genetic assumption that whenever the external stimulation changes dramatically, it creates a higher probability of danger. We process it through the limbic system, you don't need to know that, and it comes out as a fight, flight, or freeze response. So this is the column. Green is the fight, flight, or freeze that, that we would all recognize. Some of that information is implicit, pre-conscious, non-verbal. It's information, we're using it, but we are not aware of it and we can't put it in words. It's the butterflies in your stomach when you don't say butterflies in my stomach. It's the tightness in your shoulders, if you're me. I don't know where you put your tightness. That's where I put mine. Um, it's the things in your body that tell you, or conversely, the relaxation that tell you this is comfortable, I'm at ease, this is safe. Your body is talking with you all the time about its state and your viability. Is it safe to be how you are now? And it does this largely without your conscious awareness. So that's organic states. Procedural memory is this when, then, if, then that allows you to talk without thinking, how do I construct a sentence in English? What shall I do with my tongue to get the words out? And you don't think about it unless you've tried to learn a foreign language. 
And then, lo and behold, speaking has to become conscious. How do I get my mouth into that shape? Do I put the adjectives first? Where does the verb go? And suddenly you have to be conscious about the construction of language. And you can't speak when you have to be conscious about it. The whole process falls apart. I would say that most of what we do in a day, 80%, just as a round number, is done out of procedural memory without thought. You make telephone calls, you walk down the hall, you, um, you ride your bike, you drive your car, all of it largely without conscious thought. You just know how to do it, and you do it. So these are the things you are primed to do. If something startles you, you'll do this old familiar thing and not something else. Imaged memory is what I said a minute ago. It's the, um, the particular kinds of touches, the tastes, the smells. I was trying to explain how intensity of images affect the degree of reaction that we have so that moderate intensity, such as we are all experiencing now, produces very little reaction. We're in the middle of an arousal scale. We're comfortable, we're alert, but not really up. And I was talking about this in Newcastle, if I remember correctly. And I was in an auditorium with the seats that go up toward the back. And in the back were huge windows. Outside the building, they were doing construction with big cranes. And I'm talking about this, the intensity of images, and how really intense images are processed through fight, flight. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And a huge crane hits the back window. The glass explodes. The back of the room is screaming. The middle of the room is going, oh. And I'm going, there's an example. <laughs> Literally, it happened that way. So this is this implicit pre-conscious information is what I think is operating under most of the conditions that produce inappropriate parenting. I think most parents are not choosing to do what they do when it doesn't turn out well. And they don't have words for this. It isn't conscious. If you ask them, why did you do what you did? They're going to tell you what they think after the fact. But what they did was before the fact. They can't get back there. They can't tell you about it. So here are the verbalized forms of body. Oh, on other slides it says body talk. I like body talk better than verbalized states. It's how you describe what's happening in your body. Um, and then there is semantic information, which is literally statements like, if I do this, then my father will, my mother will, or my mother is always nice and my father is always angry. It's those kinds of generalized statements that cover a whole range of events and don't refer specifically to any one of them. Connotative language is the way you tell it. And this is the one you probably can quickly pick up just listening to people. Do they speak in an arousing, um, enlivening way, using words that bring images to your mind, using rhyme, alliteration, juxtaposition. Do they talk like people, like politicians? Do they talk like politicians <laughs> who use this language all the time? Or do they speak dry in language that is squeezed of affect, squeezed of emotion like a dry rag, which is the way we write professional papers. We write them very factually, very dryly, even if the paper is about affect, we write it without affect. Well, we do. Um, so, and that you can hear, you, you can listen to how people are using their language. You don't need a fancy dancy assessment. You just need to know to listen for this. If they're using lots of evocative words, then you know they're using a lot of affect to organize their behavior. If it's dry, 
then start listening for the contingencies, because that's probably what they're using to organize their behavior. Episodes are integrative. You have to take all these other memory systems, funnel them down here to say, I remember the occasion, my body felt like this, but the sun was out very bright, and my mother was saying, and usually it went like this, but on this occasion, so you've picked up the wind ends, but also the exception, and you knit together the event. That's very sophisticated. It cannot be done just by growing old enough to do it. You have to have experienced an older person who knows how to tell episodes talking with you about your events when you are two, three, four, even five years old so that you come home with one word, truck, and your mother says, you played with a truck and she elaborates it. You played with another little child and together you knit together the event. If nobody does that with a child, they won't be able to tell episodes as adults. Somebody has to teach you how to take all this information, which is activated differently across the whole brain, and to knit it together in a verbalized form that other people can understand. I use adult attachment interviews all the time to understand what people, but in this case troubled adults, know. And their ability to tell episodes is, is stunningly varied. From those who throw everything in their mind into one episode chaotically, to those who can't remember, can't remember, can't remember. And I wonder who talked with them about the events as they were growing up, so that they learned how to put this episode together. I think sometimes it's not that they won't speak, but they've never learned how to speak, and before that, think, in these ways. You can't remember easily that which has been unspeakable. And in the families we're working with, almost all of them have things that are unspeakable or unknowable or so contradictory you can't put it in words. How the same man can love you and hurt you. How, how do you put that in words when you are a child? I, I'm very interested in the unknowable. Dad's affair that makes mother very angry but I'm only five. How on earth can I get my mind around that? Uh, unspeakable. My mother was raped. And the last thing she ever wants me to know is that this happened to her or it could happen to anyone. She builds a wall between that memory and me, her child. But sometimes when she's looking at me and talking to me, I see her eyes go away. And I think it's about me because she's in front of me. But it's about this that is unspeakable because she absolutely doesn't want her to hurt me. She never wants it to get out of her head and into my life. But it got into my life when her eyes clouded over and I was trying to reach her and she couldn't be reached anymore. And maybe I, in response, started to get a little bit, I mean, I'm trying to pull her back. I'm trying to get the contingency back. But because it wasn't about me, I'm going to find it very difficult to get that contingency back. It's about something she can't tell me. It's not about me. I think it's about me. And some days, I hate her. I absolutely hate her for what she's done to me. But if I tell her that, I will crush her. Because that woman who built that wall did it to protect me. What she wants is to protect me in the next generation. And I know if I criticize her, she will crumble. So there we have two people with unspeakable information. The mother about the trauma, the daughter about her experience of the mother. And it's in that unspeakability that we start having severe disorders. 
Oh, sorry, I got off on that one, didn't I? I can come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, reflective integration is obviously the ability to put all of this active in your mind and think productively about it. Hot word in the UK today is mentalization. Mentalization is one type of reflective integration. It's the ability to think about somebody else's mind and feelings and hold in your mind an idea about their mind. That's incredibly sophisticated. If I were to put interventions in a hierarchy of sophistication, mentalization is way late in the sequence. And I'll go back to something that was on an earlier slide. Most people who endanger their children were themselves not seen accurately in their childhood. No one mentalized properly about them, so they don't have a history of empathy, and they don't have accurate reflections of who they are. And I leave that as a moderately universal statement. People in trouble do not accurately know who they are, and they've not had anyone else see them and value them as they are. Not as they might become. I love you after you learn to do this. But right now, you're breathing. I love you. That simple. They've never had it. And I'm concerned any time I hear in our interventions that we're asking people to empathize with the victim, take somebody else's perspective before we've fully elaborated their own and allowed them to feel appreciated for the person they are. Otherwise, we're asking them to wrap their adulthood around someone else's development when they wrap their childhood around their parents' development, when is it their turn? That's sort of the justice issue. But I began with, is it possible to properly understand other people if you haven't been understood? All right, there we are. That's my sequence. And I've already said, I don't think any of the people you see are at the integrative level. If they were, in the first couple of meetings, you would have resolved the problem, and they're out the door. Um, anyone who's staying in the system for a long time is probably working on implicit information. And we're engaging with them around explicit verbal information, which might not represent well what's happening implicitly. That's really my point. Okay. So then I would consider the parents' motivational framework. And these are the parenting clusters that I have in raising parents. At least in my experience, the majority of parents who come into child protection are using normal child protective behavior in the extreme. They're using it too much or too little. So neglect would be the parent's own needs result in their minimizing the child's needs and not responding sufficiently. But, but their behavior is still basically normal behavior. Or the parents exaggerate the probability of danger and overprotect the children. Remember a case that I had. Child had a wrenched shoulder or broken arm, something like that. This part of the body was sent to hospital three days after the injury and ultimately removed from the parents. Much later, after dad had been in therapy, it came out that he, as a child, an adopted child, had been repeatedly seriously abused by his adoptive father whenever he did anything wrong. And what had happened with his daughter, 
or his son, I don't remember because I've written the story and I've changed it so that it can't, so I don't remember what's real. Um, his child had gotten on a trike and was in the driveway. And for dad, that was a signal of danger. And he'd said, get out of the driveway, you could be hurt. And the child had just ignored it. And he'd gone out and wrenched that child off the trike and hurt them. He's acting out of a procedural memory from his own background of what's the safest thing to do. It's obey father, and father was trying to keep you from getting run over. Once that was understood by him, we could start doing something about it. Once it was understood by the professionals, they could see him differently. Both had to change their understanding. Then there are distortions. Oh, sorry, before I get there. That was an attempt to protect the child that ultimately endangered the child. But it was normative because his goal was to protect his child. There are other distortions that emphasize self-protection. The parent is now behaving in a way that protects themselves. And parents desire for comfort, where they are chronically distressed, can yield compulsive caregiving in the children, it can yield sexual abuse that comforts the adult, but not the child. And sometimes the parents fail to perceive the needs of the children, and now we get compulsive compliance, um, some kinds of neglect. In both cases, the parent's own state has overwhelmed their ability to see something about the child's state. The ones that are most concerning are when the parent has blocked out information about the child, maybe even blocked out information about themselves, and now they have huge gaps in what they can understand, and they substitute delusional, made-up information for the pushed out, misunderstood, accurate information. Sometimes they think that very powerful forces are threatening both them and the child. I would tell you Victoria Climbier, whom I assume you all are going to remember that tale, that this will describe the great aunt's behavior well enough, that she saw both herself and her child as being threatened by powerful forces she tried to exercise them. She tried to get help from a number of, of sources. And the outcome, of course, was injury and death. Alternately, the adult, the parent, could feel that the child is the source of the threat. Not that they are both recipients of the threat, but that the child is the source of the threat. And these are usually cases of very deliberate murder. The one that comes to mind as I stand here is Susan Smith from the United States, ooh, 10 years ago, something like that. She had been abandoned by the father of her children. It's divorce, but she felt abandoned. She had a new man on the string, but he didn't want two children. She put them in the car, pushed it into the lake, said the children were kidnapped. The children were the threat to her getting a replacement attachment figure. And that she put ahead of the children and then created this delusion of the children threatening her and being kidnapped and on we go. Okay, so getting some understanding. If it's normal child protective behavior gone awry, it's not so difficult to deal with. You only need to shape something that is there. If the parent is taking care of themselves, you now have to deal with what is that need and is there another way that we can meet it so that we don't have to go through the child. If it's delusional, I would hunt for another placement for that child very quickly. I don't see that as being a safe place in general, I'm speaking in general. Consider the level of 
integration of services that is needed. This is my simplest way of looking at what services might you need. Level of family functioning. Independent and adequate. Family's got a problem. They know how to describe it. They know what kinds of services they need. They have good access to a telephone. Let them get on with their life. Everybody has problems. They'll figure out how to solve it. Vulnerable to crisis. An independent and adequate family has some kind of a crisis that they don't know how to describe adequately. They don't know what resources to access. They are in crisis with this problem, the birth of a handicapped kid, the sudden death of a spouse, uh, things of this sort that the family didn't see coming that upset their ordinary adequate functioning. And for some time, they need someone to manage services for them because they really can't anymore. I put six months in there because in most cases an independent and adequate family that goes into crisis will be able to pick up and manage for themselves within about six months if you have given them good support services and guidance for how to use services during that time. They'll adapt to the loss, to the handicapped child, to whatever. Restorable is what I think constitutes the bulk of a child protection population. These are families that you could restore to an independent and adequate state, but they're multi-problem families. They don't have one thing to get their head around. They have 10 things that need to change. They have financial problems. They have marital or partner problems. They have problems with violence. They have problems with the neighbors. They have problems with a kid in school. They've got kids with health problems. Mom herself has got health problems. And you just, you go down the list and everybody's got something. I think these families need one to three years of carefully managed services in the zone of proximal development so that you don't attack 10 things at once with people who can't manage their daily life. So here, have 10 new tasks. And by the way, I give you 10 professionals to go with them. I know you can't manage the relationships with you, within your family, but here, have 10 more. <laughs> um, so I think the management of these services is crucially important picking out the ones that they can do now, which might not be the most important ones, but if you give them a really important one at which they will fail, you're not going to go anywhere with this family. So you're going to build, and that means you might choose something that isn't center of the field, but it can allow you to connect with them, it can allow them to feel they can do something, everybody can see the progress, that's good for us all. And I would greatly reduce the number of people that we sent out to work with the family on the logic that I just gave you. They can't manage their family relationships. How are they going to manage us? So I would send a very limited number of people out and establish relationships with them. Get someone that they can trust who, in my terms, would be a transitional attachment figure someone that they can hang on to and use for guidance and safety while they undergo a process of change. I can't think of anything that is more threatening than changing. Certainly every time I talk to professionals and say you should change, they're threatened. <laughs> um, I know this is the UK and I know you don't have one to three years of service available. I know you've got eight weeks and maybe 12, but the truth is this is what the families need. And economies go up and down and theories of service delivery um, in a political sense <coughs> change from time to time, but the problems families face do not. And they do not get quicker at recovering because our government said the services needed to be quicker doesn't change what people need. So I bring you my old slide, my old idea, and I haven't changed my mind. 
Supportable families. Supportable families are those who, with the technology that we have today, whatever that is today, 30 years ago, 10 years from now, in this community or in some other community, but whatever technology we have right here today, we can't fix them. We don't see a way to bring them to minimally adequate with what we know and can do. And I phrase it that way because what we have to give them is relevant to whether or not we can make a change. And there's lots that we don't know. That isn't their problem. That's our limitation in what we have to offer. But given that limitation, the best we can do is support these families. So we have a parent who is severely learning disabled. They have biologically produced a child, but they are not able intellectually to raise that child. We don't know how to make IQ go up when it's that seriously low. Um, we have someone with long-term serious depression, bipolar disorder, a severe personality disorder. We don't know what to do about those things now. Give them a diagnosis like schizophrenia. We don't know how to fix those things. And in the absence of that, we have to decide, do we pull the kids or do we supply the services that they can't manage, the, the functions, do we fulfill the functions that they cannot fulfill for their children for as long as they have children, until the last child is out of the house and independent. And I don't know of very many governments that are willing to supply services to a family for 20 years, 30 if they keep on having babies. For the same money, there are some families where we could keep the kids in the home if we fulfilled some specifiable functions that the parents cannot fulfill. For me, that would be the preferable answer as opposed to fostering, particularly with older children who are relatively not adoptable. But I don't know of very many, um, I'm going to use your phrase, local authorities that have that kind of, uh, of willingness to use the resources that way. In the U.S., foster care monies tend to be mandated. If you have to have them, you have to have them and they must be there. But this kind of money is not mandated, even if it would be less. So that sort of thing gets in the way. Inadequate are those who, when we take the best of our resources that are available to this family, the availability is an issue and it's on our side, not theirs, we can't keep the kids safe. We just can't keep the kids safe. And we've got to pull them and pull them as quickly as we can and get them into a, a permanent home very fast. And I know the legislation everywhere gives us short deadlines within which to do that. And my experience is we do not meet them. We, we talk about them, but this, that, or the other holds the decision making up and we don't actually meet those guidelines. So when we get here, it's now becoming very, very high risk. Ah, a slide that I loved making is coming up. Consider the point in the processing of information at which the parent loses access to the appropriate behavior. So now I'm going to talk about information processing. So we have a signal of the kid needing something. Doesn't matter what it is, but there's something in the kid that should indicate to a parent it's time to make some decisions and decide what to do. Parent has to perceive it. If they don't perceive the signal, nothing more is going to happen. Then they have to interpret the meaning of that signal 
And they might interpret, that doesn't mean anything for me. Or they might say, that has implications for what I should do next. If they think it has implications for what they should do next, they must select a response. This is the thing I will do next. But then they have to implement it. And the response they intended to do can get lost before they actually did it. And finally, they take the protective action if they got all the way through this process. Alternatively, in cases of neglect, we're going to end up with no response. They failed to respond to the signal of the child. And it could be because they didn't perceive it. So their own trauma, their own depression, something caused them not to notice the signal and suddenly we're in the no response column. Alternatively, they got the signal, but they interpreted that it wasn't about them. It isn't something they were supposed to do. And I describe children who cry and parents who hear the crying and think, but he's really sleepy and I shouldn't do anything about that. And they leave the child to cry. And he cries more and more and more and more until he's red faced and shaking and trembling. And then he will exhaust himself and fall asleep. And that parent will have learned by the positive reward of the child sleeping that the right thing to do when you hear a child cry is nothing. And so they will have perceived it, interpreted it, and bumped it out of the system, and now no response is what you get. They could have thought that it was for them, but then they selected a response that, oh, I'm sorry, I actually gave you the example for this now, um, which was don't act. That was the response they selected. They thought about it, they considered alternatives, and they decided the right response was no response. They could have perceived it, said it's about me, selected a response, and then not implemented it because their partner came home. The toddler came running through screaming. The telephone rang. They got distracted by any number of things if you've been in some, not all, but some of the multi-problem families' homes, you know that they're very distracting. Things are happening in unpredictable ways all the time. And so your intention to act, which if you talked with someone, well, in this kind of a situation, what do you think you should do? Yeah, I agree with you. That's what you should do. Why didn't you? They're going to have trouble telling you what it was that disrupted their behavior. The telephone, the toddler, the angry kids on the street that attracted their attention, the zillion things that interfered. Each one of these, if it is typical for the parent, requires a different intervention. If you didn't perceive, you need a different intervention than if things were so chaotic you got distracted. Each of these implies a different response from the professional. On the abuse side, um, I gave you the own trauma example with the arm, excessive responsibility, I have to react every single time, an overreact to the child, um, selecting the response where punishment has been reinforced, it has yielded the outcome that was desirable, so they punish more. Anytime you punish physically, I'm sorry, I mean physically. Anytime you punish physically, frequently, you run the risk that you will injure the child one or more of those times. Um, and then the implementation, the implementation on this side of the model is too quick. 
the parent doesn't have time to think about, is that what I really want to do? That's the old count to 10 rule before you do it. Give yourself a moment to reflect before you implement this thing that you have intended to do. My reason for showing you this slide is to say that most of our interventions, particularly the packaged ones, are around select a response. They are around what is the right thing to do. They are not about perceiving the moment in which you should do it. And a parent who's been through many of the packaged parenting programs might know the things to do, but miss the moment to do them. If we haven't changed their perception, they won't do the thing we've taught them to do. They might not interpret having perceived the signal that this is the moment to do that thing they were teaching me to do. You get my point? Okay, good. I think we should tailor the interventions to parents' readiness to learn, their zone of proximal con um, development, and the context in which that learning can be accomplished. So now I am talking about the home, everybody who's in it. Um, it's not just an individual. It's an individual in an interpersonal context, which is on a street somewhere. They live somewhere. And it is more or less safe there where they live, easier or less easy to implement interventions. My, my understanding is you move from social work through psychology in the direction of psychiatry, you spend less and less time in the environment where families live their lives. Instead, they come to you in your office. And if you don't know what it's like to sit in their living room for an hour and, and experience life in that house, it's going to be really hard to tailor a plan that fits their life as opposed to your office. I, I think we need a, a good understanding of the family's context, and they can't bring it to you in words. You really have to go out and <clears throat> breathe the air yourself, I think. Um, I think this is almost my last slide. I've taken interventions and put them into a gradient around information processing. So I think parent education for example, these mini package programs that are available are appropriate for parents who can integrate but who need new information. I think they're the people who either aren't in your system or are in it very transiently. Um, one of my favorite examples is a woman where I was called out because she had tried to strangle her two infant twins by pressing a broom against their two, a broomstick against their two throats at one time because they were screaming and screaming and screaming. She couldn't take it anymore. Broom will quiet children. Uh, when I went out to see her, I was astounded. She started quizzing me. Did I think that Barry Brazelton was right about raising children, or did I think that so-and-so was right? She had on the floor a stack of parenting books that was a yard high, and she knew what was in the books. She'd been reading it. She just didn't know which part applied to her and her babies. She wasn't ready to integrate. And a few years of working with such people caused me to think that parent education for people who can't integrate and are at risk, both conditions, is probably a risky thing to do. It's like giving more weapons to people who don't know when to use them. And so now they're shooting off all the time with all the new weaponry we've got. You've seen parents taught a nice um, safe technique like time out and their kid is spending an hour on the naughty step, um, we can misuse the best of approaches. So I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't expand the repertoire of people who can't yet integrate. Short-term counseling. I think it's the right thing for people who can integrate and they do have information or we've just given them some information, but they need another perspective and they need a dialogue around that perspective. They can't figure out how to use this information in their own life. This won't take forever, but they need the counseling around how how to use their integrative skills and the information to change what they do in their family setting. Parent-child interventions. Um, for parents who can use explicit information to describe problems, that is, they can describe the problem in words in ways that we recognize, we largely agree with them, about their statement of the problem. And in your most serious cases, I don't think you agree with what the parent says about the problem or the absence of the problem. Um, including their own contribution to it, they see that they are part of the problem, but they can't integrate the discrepant information. They can't make sense of their contribution in a way that allows them to change their behavior. Now, parent-child interventions that let them get feedback about their own behavior with their own child can be very useful because they're already talking explicitly about it. So with Mothers and Babies, a video feedback kind of program or a mother's group or something like that. Then I think you're needing some form of adult psychotherapy for the parent, sorry, for the adult, not about parenting, when the parent's behavior is generated implicitly, when their actions are not coming out of explicit understandings, but rather are coming from images or procedures or body states that they don't know about. Then I think you need to do some therapy with the person about the person. And when that is well underway, you can talk about the person as a parent. But the first job is to heal the person who knows so little about themselves and usually feels quite terrible about themselves. And that, of course, is a very long-term process and a and an uncertain one, not so much a risky one, but an uncertain one, whether the outcome will be a desirable outcome or not. It brings up lots of factors on the side of the therapist as opposed to the side of the patient as to whether or not this psychotherapy is going to function adequately. And again, it gives you another way to think, which services do I want to deliver? Part of my argument here is that you don't have enough money to deliver all the services you would like to deliver. Nobody in the UK, nobody anywhere does, but right now in the UK you for sure don't. So you don't want to be delivering services that somebody can't use because it isn't in their zone of proximal development. You want to hold back on that service, maybe give it to someone who can use it, but don't waste it on someone who can't use it. If I possibly overgeneralize, that would be the finding you had about Sure Start in this country. It was really intended to get to the at-risk families, and what it did was it dealt with mild risk. Those families benefited well, but the families at serious risk didn't benefit from Sure Start in its many variations across the country. And so that was, that was funding that was then wasted. Something else needed to be done. And I just say we ought to take that kind of thinking on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, parents need to understand the implicit triggers. They need to learn to verbalize. They need to recognize discrepancy. They need to integrate. God, that's a long bit of stuff there. 
I think the crucial one is they need the experience of being understood empathically themselves before they can be asked to understand someone else. And really good therapy gives that to you. And when you have people who are functioning implicitly, I would say they are not yet ready for parenting interventions. None of the parenting interventions are appropriate when they are there. But the example I gave you of the child with the broken arm and the father who yanked her off the trike, he did go into psychotherapy, individual psychotherapy for himself. In this case, dad paid for his own psychotherapy. I'm going to guess a lot of your families can't do that. But it can work. One year of effort, and now three children are growing up in their own family. For me, that's a fair return on my dollar or pound or whatever currency we're talking about. That's the book where I describe, in fact, I think Everything I've said is somewhere in that book. The big change that will come in this, I think, will be more emphasis on sexuality and more emphasis on somatic information. Those are the growing edges in my mind. I think that's all I want to say. I probably am over time, but not too badly.